Welcome back to another episode of A Journey Across Africa. In this episode, we find Guy Deacon in the country of Gabon, having traveled from Lagos, Nigeria, through dangerous territory in Cameroon. Hello, Guy. Last time we spoke, you were in Lagos, Nigeria. Where are you now? Blimey, it's a long time ago. I'm now in Libreville in Gabon, which is south of Cameroon. And um, and I've crossed over the border between Nigeria and Cameroon, which is very awkward. Broke down halfway the long journey. And I've got to Cameroon, to Gabon, and I've broken down again. So um, I've had vehicle problems a lot. Well, those road conditions have to be really tough on that vehicle. To be honest, that's the, that's the, that's the reason. The, the conditions are really, really tough. The route between Nigeria and Cameroon was basically a, a mud track between the north, where the whole Boko Haram don't let you go through, and the south, where the, the, the Anglophone separatists don't let you go through. But there's this tiny little window in between the two where you can squeeze through, and, um, and it's really, really rough. And so it's a dirt road? More than worse than a dirt road. It's, it's basically tire tracks to become a track across the hills really steep hills and river crossings and mud and slipperiness and everything really really it's the most difficult terrain i've been across wow when we last spoke you were obviously you were making plans to cross into cameroon and as you said there was uh, boko haram and the other groups in the uh in the south so take us through that journey crossing over into cameroon and your journey through through that country. Right. Well, the, fir the first thing is it took a long time to even get my visa to cross into Cameroon because the, M the ambassador for the Cameroon um, embassy said she didn't want to give me a visa because it was too dangerous to visit her own country. And getting across the border wasn't going to work. So we explored all sorts of ways, you know, going by boat around the south from Port uh, Harcourt across to Douala, um, going north, which you couldn't do. And eventually I discovered that there was this place between Gembu and Banyo, which was plied by people. And the tourists had been down it about three or four weeks beforehand. So I knew it was open, knew it was possible. And I had a, pl a police escort to the Nigerian border from Nigeria, and then a police escort by the Cameroonians from the border down to Banyo. And that was safe enough. But it took a lot of organizing, as you can imagine. What are the conditions there? Rainy, wet, poor, very beautiful, and not many people either. Nigeria is well known for having lots and lots of people and being very busy. Well, this, this is the far east, obviously it's the far eastern side, but it's not the southeast, it's sort of halfway up the country. So you've got to go to Abuja, then keep going north to get to the place where you can cross, and then turn right and all the way down through Cameroon. And Cameroon is, is where the jungle really starts. And you, the sides of the roads are uh, crowded with, with dense trees and pothole tracks and very rough roads. But it's, 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 um, it's basically equatorial forest. Any sign of Boko Haram? No, thank goodness. Um, everywhere that was incredibly friendly, uh, as, as is always the way. Um, but, uh, and, and luckily, because I, I actually broke down and had to leave the vehicle overnight by itself on the track. And it was there the next morning with everything except one wing mirror, which had been nicked, and a dent on the side as a lorry had tried to drive past it. Because it's a one-lane highway on a very slippery road. So uh, the, there's no harm came to him, which is amazing. Yeah, we were pretty worried about you going in through through that country given all that's happening yeah well i have to say it was um i was nervous but it was but it was fine and i had i had people helping me and um as is often the case if you if you're a little bit of luck a lot of planning a lot of care and attention to detail a lot of respect for people who live there and you'll probably be all right so you're now in an area where there's jungle now crowding into the track that you're driving through Describe yeah, the jungle yeah, describe that jungle for us. Well, the first thing is you can't see much of it because it's very, very thick. I, I flew a drone over a place called Lalara, which is where my vehicle is at the moment. And you look down and it's just nothing but trees. Big, big trees masking the whole of the forest floor. 
and then quite a lot of fig trees in the bottom as well, with lots of foliage. So it's very dense. But there's a lot of logging going on, which is being controlled. But you know, thousands of tons of wood are being taken out, which is making a big difference, I'm sure. And then where I was, where, where my vehicle was resting when I was broken down, there were, I must see a hundred logging trucks going past that every day, loaded up with these monstrous trunks of, of wood. So it's changing rapidly. Is there any wildlife? No. Uh, I heard monkeys and I heard elephants when I broke down because I was just stuck beside the road waiting with no noise. But no, I have, it, it, it's really hard to see. It's even quite hard to see birds because uh, that's why they're so brightly coloured so they can see each other in the, in the jungle. And that's why they sing so beautifully because they rely upon their voice rather than their sight. But um, no, it, it's, um, there, there's not much you can do. There's not much you can see apart from traffic on the roads, which there isn't much of. And the odd person pottering around, but it's um, it's 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 pretty woody. Now, as you made your way south, uh, did you run into issues with that other group that were uh... the, the separatists? No. Yes. The, I, I'm not quite clever enough to give you the precise details, but the history of Cameroon is quite interesting. And it was a German protectorate, and after the First World War, it was divided up. Well, it wasn't divided, it was shared. As a, there's a mandate for the UK and France to manage it. And the UK managed it from Lagos, and the French managed it, I think, from their Central African, um, well, it was like a super state they made, Congo, Gabon, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Niger. There's this big super state run by the French. And we ran the British bit from from Lagos, which is again a long way away. They then had a plebiscite after the First World War, and some were offered independence, some were offered uh, their own languages and goodness says what. And the result was that you ended up with this rather strange mix of an English-speaking section in the very far north, an English-speaking sort of area in the, in the southwest, and the rest is all French-speaking. And they didn't, they weren't offered independence. And one lot were offered the chance of joining Nigeria. So they actually cut their ties with Cameroon and became a part of Nigeria. So they had all those options going. And, and the, the, the Anglophones uh, feel they're getting a bit of a rough deal. So it's not, well, I don't know, it might be, because their way of life is so effective. It's not just the fact that they, they're not allowed to speak English, which they are. Cameroon is definitely a bilang bilingual country. It's that they're, it's, it's more than just language. It's, it's things like schooling, it's things like local government, it's things like education, it's all those other bits and pieces which are the British system rather than the French system. And they've grown up with, with A-levels rather than whatever they have in France. And they don't want to give all that up. And the judicial system is different as well. So the, 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 the complaints are, are more legitimate than they might seem. It's not just about speaking English or speaking French. Uh, how long were you in Cameroon? Well, I was waiting for my stuff to be fixed, and it had to be delivered to Yaoundé yeah, first from the UK, because of course there's no VW bits in Africa as far as I can make out anywhere. So that took a bit more time, and I was there about three weeks in total in the end, which is longer than I intended, and put me behind schedule a fair bit because I wanted to get to, into Gabon. While you were in Cameroon, did you get to work on spreading awareness regarding Parkinson's? Did I ever? Um, I was on television two or three times, the newspaper, newspaper articles four or five times, and the radio about three or four times. The, the, the British Embassy, the British High Commission, worked really hard at giving me maximum exposure. And there's a very good chap there called Hilaire Roger, who runs a Parkinson's support group. And he was pretty, he didn't give me any rest at all. I was always out visiting people on, you know, on the radio or whatever. Just, you know, I, was, I was earning my pay. Take us from the capital of Cameroon to where you're at now. Well, Cam I left Yaoundé at sort of seven o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was and got to the border in time to cross over. So it's about 12 hours, or it took me about 12 hours to get across the border to Cam to Gabon, which is um, a great country, actually, very French. Little villages on the side of the road which have lawns and beautifully painted houses. It's, it's like like it's like a scene out of a model village, really. Lots of wooden houses, beautifully painted, nice lawns and roses and gardens, this sort of stuff. Um, but then jungle, then another little village with painted fences and all the rest of it. It's really nice. 
Uh, and then I drove from there. I was on my way down to um, the capital, which is Libreville, which is on the coast, and broke down again. But this time I hit a pothole and broke one of the suspension unit shock absorbers, which has been a bit of a problem. So I ended up being stuck in a place called La Lara, which is the main junction between um, Libreville and a place called Manuco. And, and that's where all this logging, all these logging trucks are queuing up all the time. You know, hundreds of them on a daily basis. And quite a lot of Chinese drivers, because I gather all the wood is going off to China, simply going to China. Now, you are currently sitting in a restaurant and just off to, I think you're right, is the ocean. Yeah. Is that correct? The great Atlantic Ocean, which I've been hugging. Well, I haven't quite been hugging on my way down because I went inland in Nigeria a bit. But yeah, the, the Atlantic Ocean is just over my right shoulder. Nice. How's the food? Not bad. Not bad. But lots of chicken burritos and lots of skewers and kebab type things. Very good. And the French influence here is fantastic. So the food is generally pretty good. Uh, good French cooking. Yeah. So what is in store now? What's the next leg of the trip? Well, we've got a bit more things to do here in, in Gabon. I've got to do some interviews which we have to organize. We're going to go and visit a, a ceremony which looks at stuff called Ibangi, which is um, a drug which may have influence on Parkinson's. That's happening every weekend. We're going to go and visit the game there. It's a restaurant. And my son is coming out next week to join me for a week or two as well, which would be rather nice. Oh, that'll be nice. It'll be fun, yeah. The next stop is where? Next stop is probably Brazzaville in Central African Republic, in, in um, Republic of Congo, Brazil. And then I'm going to get across the river to Kinshasa. I think that's where I'll be. Now, what do you do? You, do you expect any issues getting to the Congo? <laughs> it's Africa. The, I answer, know. the answer is absolutely. I expect issues, but I just don't know what they are. There's going to be something, and I, and I, and I and it, it'll it'll be it'll be something I don't expect. Well, I guess that's why they call it an adventure. Exactly. It'd be boring if it wasn't like that. The people where you're at, uh, can you describe them for us? Um, they're still very influenced by the French. They, uh, the, Gabon is a very small country, but it's a big country. We've only got a population of about 2 million people, of which 600,000 live in the capital city here, or 700,000. So there, there's plenty of room, plenty of space. So there's no, there's no aggression, there's, there's no elbowing each other to get things done. And do you want the first thing I saw the other day? Well, the other day I saw for the first time a queue of people, an orderly queue waiting for a bus, like in England. And I thought that's impressive. So uh, things here are obviously very under control. And um, that's fine. Whereas in other countries, they, they, they live a bit more in ramshackle. And here, the streets are clean, houses are nicely built. It's, it's just, a, just a very nice place to be, Gabon. So the next stop is going to be which city? Brazil, Brazil, and that will hopefully be in about three or four weeks' time. That's 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 what I'm aiming for. And what, then, do, you expect, gonna... and what do you expect along the way, as far as uh, traffic conditions, people, the country? I don't expect there to be much traffic because the roads are so bad, and they're tracks. They're literally bicycle tracks in some parts, so there just isn't any traffic. It doesn't mean the roads are bad to travel on. Just means there aren't any roads as such. So, and, and the, the, the only roads that will be there, I'm hoping, will be Chinese roads going back to the question we were talking about a moment ago. So, there will either be big roads which will be fine to travel on, or non existent roads where there'll be no other traffic um, as, I, as I nudge my way towards the border. But at the moment, we're in the dry season, so there's not too much water around, which is really good news. And the countryside will still be all jungle area? Yeah, but it'll start to open out in, the, in, in Congo because it's all been forested and chopped down. That's sad to see. What do the people there think about the yeah, deforestation? Yeah, what do the people there think about the deforestation? They don't. Well, some do. 
and those who, those who understand and, and care about it can, are very unhappy about it, but most people they have to live. They've just got to get on with it. And they have very short-term issues to worry about, and they can't be worried about the planet because there's been, the, the amount they can do is nothing compared to what the Chinese, the Americans, the British, and the Europeans can do. So I, I feel for them, actually. They've, they've, got to get, they've got to live and make money as well. Interesting dynamic. Yeah, but as it happens, the Gabonese are very, very strict on the amount of what wood can be taken and what size wood. And they have they have forest police who check all the trucks they're getting past. At least they're making, to do an yeah, so at least they're making some effort to make oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're doing as good a job as they can, to be honest, yeah. Excellent. Now, today, do you have any interviews planned? I've just spent the morning with a French anthropologist talking about the Gabonese society, which covered everything from cultural to religious to um, geographical to all sorts of stuff. And we're going to make a, that'll be quite a big chunk, I suspect, of the film. Fascinating. And this afternoon, I'm going to go and do some visa work to make sure I'm ready to get into Congo. So, but we'll, and, uh, and so you need to push embassy to make sure I get the next sort of visa sorted, the next sort of interview sorted out. So there's always stuff going on. Excellent. Did you expect to be this busy? No, not really. I thought I was just drifting along quietly and it would be absolutely fine. But breaking down is a, adds a dynamic and means you spend more time in the city than you should. And, I've, and there's been more interested in, and I've met more people than I was with the week as well. So that's, that's taken its time as well. And have you been have you been surprised at the reception you've been given regarding speaking about Parkinson's? I've been heartened. Uh, well, I've been surprised that some people knew nothing about it, and I've been heartened that people want to know about it. And um, and I've gained quite a lot of good access to various people, including chief medical officers in three or four countries, and told. Them talking about Parkinson's. So I've started a conversation in many places. So I'm very content that I'm doing the right thing and spreading the word, which is really what I want to do. So I'm meeting my mission, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I, didn't think it'd be, I, I didn't think I'd be doing quite as well as I am, to be honest. I thought it'd be more difficult. But, you know, once you press the right button, people want to hear about it. Yes. Very good. Well, be safe and... We'll catch up with you in the Congo. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Brazzaville or Kinshasa, or maybe even Angola. Excellent. All right. Be All safe. Right. Yeah, good to talk to you. Thank you for joining us. As we await another dispatch from the field, please check out my podcast, Whiskey and a Map, featuring stories of adventure and exploration as told by those who live them.